Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show and happy Monday. I hope you had a couple of days off thanks to the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, I did, we took some time off with the fam and uh, went to warmer climates where, you know, it's okay. Like I don't take in the sun. That's eh. So it's constantly like a battle to avoid the sun when we go someplace nice. And, it, and I'm not gonna lie, it was very buggy. It was very, very buggy and I'm not a big bug. However, I love my time with my family. <laughs> that was awesome. And um you know, I just a couple of days off was nice too. So I missed all of you. I missed the news and we have a lot, a lot to go over. Hope you guys had a wonderful holiday. Okay. Late yesterday, President Biden did something he and his media allies have promised over and over and over again that he would not do. This guy is an abject liar. He might, and he has the nerve to, while he's, he's telling yet another lie, which is that he doesn't lie, to keep lying. Like there's at every turn, he just lies. The, everyone knew he was going to pardon Hunter. We all knew that. At least that's my perspective. But you see the left absolutely shocked today. <laughs> They're shocked. Like they actually believe this guy when he was like, I know I'm not going to pardon him. And we're all like, you know, he's totally going to pardon him. He's a liar. That's all he does is lie. And he, he was in on his son's crimes. So yes, of course, he'll, he'll be pardoning him. But the left is like, oh, that half of them are like, oh, and then the other half are like, oh, he's a good father. He loves his, <laughs> it's like a good microcosm of the divide in this country on this man this whole problem with the Biden crime family, as it's called. Um, and really kind of, I hope, yet another wake-up call to our friends on the left that they are consuming their news from the wrong places. <laughs> You've been misled again. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go through the timeline. The dates actually are important. It starts back in January of 14, just before... Um, Hunter Biden joined the board of Burisma, this Ukrainian energy company, and Hunter had no expertise in energy whatsoever. His dad was the sitting vice president of the United States, and he's been pardoned through that date, from that date, through yesterday, the day of the pardon. Now, why would you have to go back to all that stuff? I mean, we all know why. Because Joe Biden is pardoning himself and not just his son. He wants to make sure that all of those alleged crimes for which his DOJ already gave Hunter a pass remain untouched. Um, The president, after lighting this match, promptly jetted out of town to Africa. (laughs) I mean, good on him, right? A couple of middle fingers for everyone right before he leaves office. Um, Of course, many, as I said, knew that this promise that he's been making over and over was empty. Um, we've all been saying it, and I don't know. Does it change anybody's view of what's going to happen? And most importantly, I guess the question is, does it change what President Trump is likely to do once he is sworn in again with respect to the J6 defendants? Because that's what the left is really worried about. Joining me now, uh, it's National Review Day here at the MK Show. Editor-in-Chief Rich Lowry and senior writer Charles C.W. Cook, host of the Charles C.W. Cook podcast, Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. Four years of crushing interest rates, runaway inflation, and reckless government spending, and who is paying the the price? You are. You might have bills stacking up, debt collectors on your back, and barely able to keep food on the table. Well, done with debt can be a way out. They have developed new aggressive strategies designed to get you out of debt permanently without bankruptcy or loans. Done with debt stands between you and your bill collectors. They can go head to head with creditors, getting balances reduced, interest rates slashed, and penalties stopped. They create a plan to end your debt fast and put even more cash in your pocket every month. And right now, Done With Debt is accepting new clients. But you need to act fast because some credit relief programs expire. Before you make another payment, consider a visit to donewithdebt.com or call 1-888-322-1054 right now. Speak with one of their debt relief strategists for free. Just go to donewithdebt.com. That's donewithdebt.com. Rich and Charlie, welcome back. Am I wrong? We all knew this was coming. Everyone who consumes media that is not far left 100% knew this was coming. We didn't like it. We didn't support it. But nobody believed his lies, Rich, that he wasn't going to do it. 
Yeah. So some lies that politicians tell are irritating because you believe them. Right. And then you're really disappointed when they turned out they were lying to you. This is irritating because it was so blatantly obvious. Right. And the honorable thing to do would have been said, say, no comment when asked about this or I'm not going to address hypotheticals or, or whatever. Instead, they blatantly lied. It was part of the scheme. As soon as he considered it, what back in June, he started lying about it. So this but it's typical Biden, you know, this great protector of our norms and the small D democratic politics has been a dishonest hack his entire life. So this is a, a proper and fitting coda to his sordid career. Yeah, there here is just a little of for those of you who forgot it of Joe Biden. Here's one example of him making that promise. What's the date of this first one, Debbie? Saw one, we'll find it. Listen here. Will you accept the jury's outcome, their verdict, no matter what it is? Yes. And have you ruled out a pardon for your son? Yes. I'm extremely proud of my son, Hunter. He has overcome an addiction. He is, he's one of the brightest, most decent men I know. And uh, I am satisfied that I'm not going to do anything. I, sa- I said I'd abide by the jury decision. And I will do that. And I will not pardon him. Those are all from June. I mean, he went back, Charles, we know that. But those are just, that's just June. It's not like a lifetime ago. And he issues this infuriating statement. I mean, infuriating, acting like a bunch of stuff has happened, you know, between then and now that really changes his whole perspective on everything. It's really not true. He says the following, uh, This is crazy. People are almost ever brought to trial on felony charges solely for how they filled out a gun form. As if this is really all just about the gun, right? That is the trial that he had, but there's a reason he was only tried at that trial on the gun form thing. He goes on to say that those who were late paying their taxes because of serious addictions, but then paid them back subsequently with interest and penalties are typically given non-criminal resolutions. It is clear the hunter was treated differently. This is so galling, Charlie, so galling. It's hard to know where to start with this. It's so galling. And the backdrop to this, of course, is that prior to becoming vice president, then retiring and then becoming president, Joe Biden's main contribution to the canon of American law was to increase the penalties for gun crimes and drug crimes, and often to increase the penalties where those two things intersected. He spent years, decades, railing against people who had addiction and saying that it didn't matter. There's a speech he gave in the Senate where he says it doesn't matter. That's not what's important, whether people are addicted or not. So, so <clears throat> the history here is is interesting in and of itself. Um, but the, the chutzpah of this statement, I mean, NBC News published a piece, a reported piece this afternoon in which it... Uh, suggests that Joe Biden had decided in June that he was going to say that he would not pardon his son, even though the plan was to pardon his son. But it wasn't just that he lied about it and then changed his mind. The plan was to lie about it and then change his mind. You can look it up. Go read the NBC News story. That was part of the whole approach. And then he has the temerity in the statement that you just quoted from to finish it by saying, (laughs) throughout my entire career, I've had one principle to which I have hewed, and that's to tell the American people the truth. (laughs) So he says that in the statement in which he is announcing a pardon that he had said for six months, having planned to do so, that he was not going to pardon his son. I mean, you just... You just could not write it. It's 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 extraordinary. The whole thing is such a great example of corruption. And what makes it more annoying than most of Biden's annoying habits is that this has been used over and over and over again to demonstrate Biden's supposed moral superiority, his integrity, his honesty, his willingness to stick to the rules, what separates him from others, why one has to vote for him or his vice president, because he's the sort of man you see who understands the rule of law, respects the rule of law, even when his own son is involved. And of course, it just turns out that it was an election year ploy and the whole thing was a massive lie. And that's before we get, as I'm sure we will, 
to what you were adumbrating earlier, which is this bizarre super pardon uh, that covers activity for 10 years, much of which hasn't yet been prosecuted. Mm-hmm. You know, I, the thing about this, as you say, multi-layered here, but one of the things about this that really gets me is he's trying to make a victor out of Hunton. It's clear Hunter, Hunter was treated mm-hmm. differently. Mm-hmm. He's trying to make a victim out of him. And as opposed to like, you, you know, if you guys lied and said that your payments on strippers and hookers were tax write-offs, like you wouldn't be prosecuted. You know, it was just poor Hunter who had to deal with that. And it was really just his addiction. Like if usually addicts just get a pass, it's only poor Hunter who didn't. And the audience has heard me talk about this in bits and pieces over the years. And I'll, I'll just offer this. My own sister got swept up into the opioid crisis. And truly, it was truly not through fault of her own. She was, um, she, she needed a pain medication after this incident she suffered. And they gave her this drug and specifically told her, like we saw in Dope Sick with respect to um, OxyContin, though her drug was not OxyContin, that it wasn't addictive. So she started taking this drug and sure enough, she got addicted. And then she got really addicted and her life went to hell. I mean, just, we'd never had, you know, an alcoholic or drug addict, you know, that wasn't a thing that was really in our family. And my poor sister's life got completely blown up by this thing, by this addiction to the point where she ultimately, once the family sort of tried to let her have a hard love, a tough love period where we weren't helping her out of the jams that she was creating, um, found herself in the, in the throes of the criminal law. I mean, it was petty any stuff, but she, she did wind up on the wrong side and you know what she did? She had to handle it. She had to get a public defender. She had to handle the the penalty. She didn't go to jail or anything like that, but she, she it remained a mark on her record forever. And you know what that does to a person? You can't get a job. You cannot get a damn job because it's on there. And no one gives a damn that you were addicted. No one cares about that backstory I just gave to you. So fuck you, Joe Biden, and your sob story about your rich, spoiled presidential kid, Hunter Biden, and how he's been singled out. Because I know I speak for millions of people who have an addict in their family who did something they're not proud of, who could never get out from under it. We have no sympathy for you, Hunter Biden, and even less for you, Joe Biden, because you enabled all of it. You were using him to line your own pocket. That is what the emails suggest, 10% for the big guy and Tony Bobolinsky and others. And Rich, this is why, just one of the many pieces, why this whole thing is so irritating. Yeah, so I think everyone has sympathy for his addiction, right? I, I, I go on this this New York radio show, Sid Rosenberg. He, he was one of the uh, warm-up acts at, at MSG and he had terrible addiction problems, blew up his whole radio career. He says, you know, you hate yourself every single time you do it right, and I, I'm sure Hunter was there with that self-loathing as well. No one criticized him for that, except for maybe some dumb things Matt Gates said said along the line. The problem was the crimes, right? And the the idea that he was a, a victim of Joe Biden's own Justice Department, when clearly the the original plan was to have the holdover a DA up there just just slow walk this and and do nothing about it. Right. That, that was the first idea. And then was when there was public pressure about it and accountability about it, then they came up with this this plea deal. Right. That ref, that the president refers to as a carefully negotiated plea deal, which might be the truest phrase in the entire statement. Yes, it was carefully negotiated to give Hunter every possible uh, break and to make this thing basically go away. And then he complains in the statement that there was outside pressure about the plea deal. Yeah, people pointed out it was a travesty and that it couldn't survive first contact with an independent judge. That's when it blew up. So so the so the idea that that it was Joe Biden's haters who, you know, responsible for the plea plea deal going away or the plea deal was was uh, straight up at, at the beginning was was crazy. He was afforded every possible consideration by Biden's Justice Department until it became unsustainable. And then he was treated more or less like anyone else in one of these cases. And look, but only when they were forced. Yeah, when they were forced. And most fathers, yeah, they would they would do this, right? They would pardon him. They wouldn't see him go to jail if they had the par- the power to do that, which everyone knew, right? Which is why one of the reasons we knew it was a lie. And then finally, it doesn't mention at all, even though the 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 dates, as you point out, encompass this conduct, the the self-dealing, 
and the the Biden lobbying and influence peddling business, which is what everyone was after, right? The gun charge is penny ante compared to that stuff. And because the prosecutor up there let the statute of limitations kind of roll on and uh, uh, most of this stuff get past it, that'll never be prosecuted. And that was the, the real abuse of public trust. I'm just now realizing the saying is petty ante. That makes more sense. Or penny, penny ante, not petty ante. That makes so much more sense because if you ante only a penny, it's nothing. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, things you learn on, on camera. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, my note next to this statement that, you know, that we're going through, here's my note, especially the part I just read about serious addictions. F you, F you, F you, F you. It just it feels <laughs> personal to me. For anybody who's got an addict in the family who had to actually live up to the consequences of their bad choices, you should, you should, uh, I think you should is auction feeling off your you should auction off your unexpurgated uh, show know. notes yeah. at some point for like a charity. That. Yeah, I'll do it. I, I mean, it'd have to be a charity that has a tolerance for potty mouth. <laughs> um, here is the part in that Rich was referring to, Charles, uh, just to fill out what this statement by Biden. Uh, says how it reads. The charges in his cases came about only after several of my political opponents in Congress instigated them to attack me and oppose my election. Then a carefully negotiated plea deal agreed to by the Department of Justice unraveled in the courtroom with a number of my political opponents in Congress taking credit for bringing political pressure on the process. No reasonable person who looks at the facts of Hunter's cases can reach any other conclusion than Hunter was singled out only because he is my son and that is wrong. Like the miscast of what actually happened here, that the charges only came about after several of my political opponents instigated them to attack me. No, he was shielded from those charges, which were serious felonies as outlined by those two IRS whistleblowers who since came forward. He was shielded by you because of his name and by others because of his name. And only when the whistleblowers came forward and it became very clear what had happened within the DOJ and the IRS was the DOJ forced to bring what was left of the charges because the vast majority of them had been intentionally allowed to expire. Yeah, so however you look at this, it, it, there's a hole in the logic from Biden. So the first thing is Biden's the president. He's in charge of the executive branch, Article 2. So are we saying that he instructed the DOJ to do this erroneously? Well, if not, then he's outsourced it. And then we have to believe that Merrick Garland is some rogue within the DOJ, which he seems not to be. I doubt Biden would agree with that. Uh, And then you get to the second option, which is that the DOJ is part of the deep state, which is something that the Bidens of the world say doesn't exist. And if this is what the DOJ does because of political pressure from television and Congress and the dastardly Republican Party, uh, then surely Donald Trump has a point uh, about the nature of the bureaucracy. But I don't think that um, they would concede that. Um, Then you've got uh, the question that arises, if, if neither of those is true, uh, then ought we to have the laws under which Biden, uh, Hunter Biden, that is, was prosecuted? And w- one thing I keep hearing today from anyone who is defending this or half defending this is, well, we don't <clears throat> prosecute people who lie on Form 4473. Uh, which is a a form that was created subsequent to the Gun Control Act of 1968 uh, that asks various questions. Are you a felon? Are you a citizen? Are you addicted to illegal substances and so forth? Um, Well, if if the case is that it's outrageous to prosecute someone for lying on that form, could we get rid of it? Uh, Can we perhaps pardon everyone else who has been sent to prison or convicted of a felony based on their lies on that form? Uh, If we don't prosecute people uh, for being under the influence while in possession of a firearm, uh, maybe we have a lot of work to do as a country in getting those people uh, out of prison and getting their records expunged as well. And yet what I hear from... Right, but what I hear from Joe Biden um, is actually the opposite rhetoric. So what you will hear now 
is on the one hand that the biggest problem that the United States faces in its tax system is people who cheat, people who don't pay the taxes their own, wealthy people who, instead of putting money into the treasury, go out and spend it frivolously. For example, let's just say on uh, sports cars and strippers, <laughs> uh, which Hunter seems to have done, <laughs> which is why I'm told we need 87,000 new IRS agents, we need to beef up audits and so on and so forth. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, we've, we've got guns too. Uh, the problem with the United States at the moment in that realm is that we don't have enough gun laws and we don't enforce them properly. And uh, we have a, an under regulation issue in America. And this is a huge problem, right? On, on this piece of paper that Joe Biden put out yesterday, though, it says that no one would have gone after anyone for these sorts of crimes uh, unless they were called Hunter Biden. So which is it? Do we have a problem with rich tax cheats who are not caught by the system and a total lack of enforcement of those who are not supposed to own guns owning guns? Or is it the case that the only people who would ever be prosecuted for this stuff, even when the evidence is overwhelming as it was in this case, um, are, are Hunter Biden because of his political connections? You've got to pick one. And it's another aspect of this that I just find so irritating is that basically Joe Biden's position is we need to go after people who illegally purchase firearms, who are not allowed to own firearms, and we need to go after wealthy tax cheats unless they're called my Hunter Biden. I mean, it's just, it, 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 there's no way of getting around it. Yeah, no, I, you think about all the people who are being prosecuted right now for being tax cheats and how they're feeling today. That I, I guess if I stole more, if I cheated even worse, maybe I could get the Hunter Biden exception because you know I'm told by the president mm -hmm. of the United States that those who are late paying our taxes because of serious addictions, but then pay them back subsequently with interest and penalties are typically given non-criminal uh, resolutions. Well, what if you're one of the ones who wasn't given that and you're looking at this statement today? Or what if you're one of the ones who was prosecuted under this gun form uh, and you have a very different result than Hunter Biden? And of course, you know, Rich, now what we're hearing is, well, Trump pardoned Jared Kushner's dad um, and just made him ambassador to France. And Bill Clinton pardoned his half brother, stepbrother uh, over yes. drug charges. But both of those guys had served their sentence. They, they had mm -hmm. paid the penalty that a jury had inflicted on them and had lived up to what, you know, the DOJ required of them, which was sit for a trial, listen to what a jury finds and then serve the sentence. That's yeah. not what's happened here. <clears throat> yeah. So it's not just that he's not going to serve the sentence as NR's Andy McCarthy has pointed out the timing here, which is a little weird Sunday and a holiday weekend. Okay. Maybe that makes sense. You want to bury the news, but you would have thought he'd waited right to the end of his mm -hmm. administration and said, why is he doing it now? Because he doesn't want sentencing to happen, which is when you know this better than I do. But that's when when the felony is actually recorded. Right. When you technically become a convicted, a convicted felon. felon. So this stops him from being a convicted felon. Uh, so not just not getting sentenced or going to jail, but but he won't actually be a, be a felon for these crimes. And it wasn't just that on on the gun charge, right, that he lied on the form and then he safely put the gun in a safe and and, and that was it. <laughs> there is this turmoil in his life. And I guess what his, his girlfriend or his, his wife at the time has to is worried he's going to do harm to himself with a gun and dumps it in a trash can on the school grounds or near school grounds. So there's a major, major aggravating factor there. And you also hit on a, a, a key point just a, a moment ago. It's not just that Biden's political opponents were, were on this. James Comer was a political opponent. I think he did great work. And just because a political opponent doesn't mean it was he wasn't on to something or it wasn't legitimate. But there are whistleblowers. They really forced this. And if there's anything we've known from the media and from Hollywood, whistleblowers are good, right? <laughs> they, they, they uncover wrongdoing. They should be honored for their bravery. But in this case, they've, they've been disappeared. But they, they were a, a key aspect to getting this case moving because they were so appalled by what they were seeing because they knew it was special treatment of someone who had a political connection. Yes. I mean, if it hadn't been for those guys, who knows what would have happened? But they came out and said this was there were so many felonies that this guy committed. We, and they said to me on this show and to many others and before Congress as well, we absolutely would normally go after a person who had done what Hunter Biden did. Absolutely. In no way would that have been because he was the president's or the, at the time he committed the crimes, the vice president's son. If anything, that was an impediment 
just even on paper, never mind when the DOJ actively started to slow roll it. You know, they're careful about going after somebody who's a public figure. But absolutely, jo- Joe Schmo would have been charged on all of these crimes. And let's not forget there's the whole matter of, you know, acting as a foreign agent with respect to Burisma and the Chinese and all this. is There's this other sea of potential criminality dating back to 2014, all of which was allowed to expire thanks to yep. the Biden Justice Department. And All you need to do is listen to Andy's weekly podcast with Rich, Mm -hmm. uh, the Andy McCarthy podcast, because they've gone over this in great detail for years now. And, you know, if you listen to it and if you watch this show, too, because we talk about it as well, then you know this, this is a long, long list of crimes that Hunter Biden is accused of having committed, almost all of which were whitewashed away thanks to statutes of limitation being allowed to expire by Democratic controlled DOJs. Um, however, this is this today. I think it's an issue because the left that's mad thinks Trump will use it as an excuse to pardon the J six defendants. Eh, he doesn't need an excuse. He's been saying running for office he was going to do it. Like I guess this makes it a little bit softer when he does it, but. Okay, that's what they're going to say. And but I think the other problem with for the left is that they're embarrassed because they actually did like either actually believe him or just openly pretended to believe him. And now they look like fools. Here are three examples together. Stephanie Rule uh, from June, Mika Brzezinski from June and a former deputy U.S. attorney, Andrew Weissman, who's an MSNBC fixture. Um, it's a montage of him. Take a listen. Their latest attack has been that Joe Biden has politicized and weaponized the DOJ, right? That was the whole argument around Donald Trump's conviction. And this week, of course, Hunter Biden was found guilty. And Joe Biden has very clearly said he would not pardon his son. He would not commute his sentence. How stark is this difference? I mean, how can Republicans keep making stark. this argument now that that no, now that Joe Biden has really put it out there? Where's Hunter? Mm-hmm. And he stood there in a courtroom mm-hmm. flanked by his family and he's accepted his sentence. The current president of the United States has so much respect for the law that he has said he would not pardon so much. his son. I mean, what? Yeah. You know, again, it's all about the contrast. President Biden saying, I will respect whatever this jury decides versus Donald Trump after he was convicted on 34 counts, saying the entire system is rigged (laughs) against him. He is not pardoning um, his son, um, which he could do. These are federal charges. He is not doing that. He is not doing it because he is living what it means to have a rule of law in this country. He did not pardon his son. He did not order the Department of Justice to to say, don't prosecute my son. So impressive. Contrast is so clear in terms of decency and principle and transactional um, uh, guidances in terms of how you view the world. What is before us is a president who is living the rule of law. He is living it in the most... In the most personal way, the, the what he is actually living by is his own son is being prosecuted and he is um, allowing the norms that are required to live in a democracy to go forward. Getting a little misty eyed, Rich. That was really, that was <laughs> quite moving. <laughs> oh, they've, they've humiliated man. themselves. Oh, totally. And it also goes to... It's easier to lie when you're a Democrat because you, you have all, all these people with major media platforms just willing to, to swallow it. And what contempt does Joe Biden have for his media allies, right? If you're a man of decency and, and you've lied and you have other people making idiots in themselves by believing their lies, you know, you, you might feel a little guilty about that. Apparently none whatsoever. They are play like fools. And look, some of these people might be sincere about protecting Democratic norms, but Joe Biden was always a horrible vessel for it. And it, it's just a symptom of our, of our time that people can't say, you know what, I don't like Trump, but but Biden is is a dishonest hack who's been peddling, you know, his family has been benefiting uh, um, off his name forever, right? Both those things can can be 
be true, but they won't. They needed to, to put them on a pedestal that was uh, made made out like it was this uh, steadfast marble that could never be toppled. And the thing was styrofoam all along. It was a complete lie from the beginning to the end. And here's the thing, to, just to put the lie to the lie, back to that portion of the statement that you referenced, Charlie, that I didn't yet read. For my entire career, I have followed a simple principle. Just tell the American people the truth. They'll be fair-minded. Well, here's the truth. I believe in the justice system, but as I have wrestled with this, I also believe raw politics has infested this process and it led to a miscarriage of justice. And once I made this decision this weekend, there was no sense in delaying further. Okay, nothing has happened between his June statements that he would not pardon Hunter and now to change any of the facts that he's relying on in his statement for why he's doing the pardon. Like everything that he's pointing to happened before Hunter was found guilty in June, which is the case only came about after several of my political opponents in Congress instigated them to attack me. We've shown the audience that that's not true, but that even if that is true, that all happened well before June where he said he was not going to pardon them. Then a carefully negotiated plea deal fell apart. That again happened long before June. Uh, Hunter was singled out only because he's my son, blah, blah, blah. It, this is all before June. So then he finishes it with, I've always followed a simple principle. Just tell the American people the truth. Here's the truth. The raw politics has infested this process, blah, blah, blah. So, the, I mean, there's absolutely no question that it's all a lie. And he doesn't really care whether people know it or not. And I actually wondered whether, it, you know, you're, you're right. He didn't want sentencing to, hap to happen, but I actually wondered, because he could have done it on like Thursday night. If you really want to bury something over Thanksgiving holiday, you you release it Wednesday night or Thursday night. I mean, people are with their families. I actually wondered whether this is a middle finger to the media, because you know it's going to get coverage if you do it the Sunday before the Monday that all the press returns to the news cycle, most of whom are too lazy to go back and figure out what happened over the past six days and would much prefer to focus on new red meat that is pretty easy to understand. I almost think he wanted to rub their noses in it, Charles. He may have. I think this is such a great example of how the Democrats have used Trump as an excuse for their own desires. Now, I won't defend Trump on this. Trump will definitely abuse the pardon power. Most presidents <laughs> abuse the pardon power. I actually think the anti-federalists were right about the pardon power uh, on balance. I think probably it needs some sort of congressional review, but it doesn't have it. Uh, the president has plenary power here. It's non-justiciable. No one can alter it, oversee it, um, reverse it. So I fully expect Trump to abuse it as he did last time. But I think what you have seen here is uh, the knowledge, perhaps, from the Andrew Weissmans of the world, that whatever happens, he will be able to wiggle out of it by just saying, but Trump. The Joe Biden presidency was the but Trump presidency. People found it hard to make affirmative case for Joe Biden. So they would just say, but Trump. So if Biden ends up uh, winning, or if Harris, once she had taken over, wins, uh, then maybe she pardons him and you can say you were right that Biden didn't do it. If uh, Biden or, and then Harris lose the election, then you can say, well, we had to pardon him uh, because of Trump. And this is the emerging line now, is that we had to give Hunter Biden a 10-year untrammeled pardon that applies to absolutely everything. Actually, if you look at the way it was written, uh, it gave Hunter Biden sort of four hours at the end of the day yesterday where he could have gone out and committed all manner of crimes because the pardon <laughs> lasted until midnight. But it's a 10-year untrammeled pardon. And the, the line I've started to see from those who are defending it is, well, we, we didn't want to do that, but we had to do this because Trump is so vindictive, he's so out of control, he's such a dictator, that he was going to come in and then order his Department of Justice to go after Hunter Biden on a frivolous pretext. So it was absolutely necessary for Joe Biden to inoculate his son against the ravages of Trump Hitler. And you know, when you do that, Megan, what you've done is you've given yourself permission 
to essentially do whatever you want on the grounds that uh, the other person made you do it. And we've seen this with, say, the Supreme Court, where the worst idea in all of American history, which is, I mean, structurally, not, not slavery, obviously it's number one, but structurally, uh, it was to pack the Supreme Court. You know, back in the 1930s, uh, President Roosevelt's own party said, don't do this, this is, a, this is a tyrannical move. And it became, over the years, this sort of byword for hubris and corruption. Uh, Joe Biden himself talked about it in a famous speech in 2006, where he harkened back to the dark days of FDR trying to pack the court. But now, the Democrats have to pack the court because of Donald Trump. They have to abolish the filibuster because of Donald Trump. They have to undermine the Electoral College in the Senate because of Donald Trump. And once again, this is the argument that we're seeing, that yes, it is awful to abuse the pardon power in this way, except Trump made them do it. And so I just yep. wonder if you're Andrew Weissman sitting there at MSNBC, or you're Mika Brzezinski, or you're Stephanie Rule, or anyone else who made that case, you sort of know at the back of your head that you have a get out of jail free card. Because if by Biden does do it, you will be able to say in the same studios to the same people in front of the same audience, well, of course, Biden didn't want to do it, but he had to because of Trump and all of the people who applauded you the first time around and said, yeah, this is an indication of the integrity of Joe Biden, will just sit there and clap uh, as if that is some sort of meaningful excuse. It's so true. Here, you don't actually have to wonder. Here's actually a very fun example that we found of uh, MSNBC commentator Molly Jong Fast. Now, here is what she oh, originally said. No. You're not going to do this said, to you. Yeah. You're not going to do this Brace yourself. To you, are you, Megan? Brace yourself. Here she is in June when he said he was not going to pardon. I think Joe Biden has a chance here to stand up for the rule of law, to say the, rule, the law is the law, no matter who it is, no matter if it's Trump or a Biden. And remember, part of Trumpism's dangerousness is that it tears down institutions, important institutions of our democracy. So there is an opportunity here for Biden to say, you know, the jury found him guilty. This is how it's supposed to work. Period, paragraph, end of story. Norms and institutions. And here she was this morning. Molly, fast and furious, what do you make of this new news? Um, I so, <laughs> I just heard it. I I have to process it. I I don't have a take. I'm sorry. <laughs> she just heard it. She she went on. That was this morning, was it? So she no, went last, on a last night. Correct show. myself. Last night. Oh, it was last night. Yeah. She yeah. So she it. couldn't. I, but she had no I idea it was coming, Charles. Her. She was she was just not like who who knew who could have foreseen. And then had a thought that the pardon would come. And here's uh, this on her Blue Sky account. That's the left wing Twitter that everybody's now running to because they're afraid of Elon. She tweeted this morning and we're, now we're thinking, OK, we're on to something. She tweeted, protect norms and institutions, protect norms and institutions. And I'm like, OK, she's going to let him have it. Protect norms. Yeah, OK, protect norms and institutions, protect norms and institutions. And guess what she was tweeting about? Uh, this article from Washington Post. Amid worry about Trump calls for career Justice Department staff to stay. <laughs> she's, she's saying, don't change the staff at the DOJ. That's what she's tweeting. Norms and institutions, nothing about the, the pardon. That I, I have no take. I don't, this reflects poorly on Joe Biden, so I really can't think of anything to say. It's a, yeah. it's a mystery. Uh, here is, I'll give you another, another pivot point, Rich, if you don't want to talk about Molly. Because um, I know you love her and you... <laughs> she should get the um, Jen Rubin. You should give a Jen Rubin award every week. And M M Molly is an early contender. She is actually. She could be. Uh, she's in the same exact field. Yeah. MVP. Here is another spin that's coming. Charles is right. The one is but Trump, and here's the other in SOT eight from Biden's former White House director of message planning, Megan Hayes. I do think with some of the nominations that Trump has put up, I think it probably caused a little bit of worry for him. But also, I think people have to remember the president has lost two children already and he does not need to lose another one to more political, you know, witch hunts that, he, that the president's calling them. He doesn't he worries about Hunter going to jail there. I and mean, there's a lot of things wrapped up in this. But I think at the end of the day, the president made a decision as a father to keep his son out of jail and out of harm's way moving forward. He, again, does not want to lose another son. He has lost two children already, and he does not want this to like go on any further once he leaves office. Uh, didn't didn't want to use, lose another son. 
Oh, that's a medic. That's that's disgraceful to to compare Hunter going to jail for crimes he committed to the the tragic deaths of uh, uh, other children. It's, it's just it's just crazy, right? It's it's why can't you just say he's a father? He doesn't want to see his son go to jail. At, at, end of story. And he doesn't care. Uh, he's not going to let any considerations about norms or institutions or anything else trump that personal commitment. That's that's. Right. That's that's something that's true. It's something that kind of people would understand. It's not necessarily very praiseworthy, but it's very human. But they they build up this whole edifice where he was so, something special and had this commitment yep. to democratic norms above everything else. And it was demonstrated by letting this case go forward when it was very easy to let it go forward when it was when it was happening, when the convictions happened. Right. He wasn't going to there's was no way he's going to pardon him right then. These things always happen at the end. And maybe if he'd won again or Kamala had won again, he wouldn't even have to do it at the end of this term. But he would have done it pretty quickly before he went to, to jail, right? That was always obvious. And they they were willfully blind to it to create this, this story. And Charlie's correct about just the, the Hitler construct, construct is such a permission slip for them. You know, the the bulwark, the, the, the ne- Never Trump publication had a podcast at the election. And one of these guys on the podcast was basically saying, because Trump's Hitler – the Democrats need their own Hitler, right? We need a strong man and we should have changed, you know, we should have jammed through two new uh, states, D.C. and Puerto Rico to get more senators. We should have packed the court already, you know, on and on. So they they become what they think they're opposing and they they can't see it because they're so blinded by hatred to Trump. Uh, for well, Trump. So I don't think there's any accident, Charlie, that this is the former White House director of messaging raising. He doesn't want to lose another son. This is what Joe Biden's favorite trick has been. Yeah, well, leave aside the mawkishness of it. And I've written a great deal about that. Joe Biden uses his son Bo's death as a weapon in a way that he should not. He brings it up in almost every circumstance, many of which are inappropriate. We've heard from the parents of um, uh, deceased military members uh, who have asked him not to do it. Uh, But leave aside the mawkishness of that statement for a moment, which is supposed to tug on your uh, heartstrings and make you ignore the question at hand. And suppose that that is true. That was true in June. So if it is the case, that Biden is so upset at the prospect of Hunter going to jail, having lost two children, which he did do, and that was horrendous, uh, that he simply cannot allow this to happen, then he should not have spent nearly six months promising the American public that he was not going to pardon Hunter Biden. The clips you played were not ambiguous. Sometimes you can wiggle out of language. But the last clip you played at the beginning of this episode He literally says, I am not going to pardon him. Now, that is emphatic and it's absolute. So if it is the case that what she is saying is correct, then that should have been the line from June. It should have been the line whenever Karine Jean-Pierre was asked about it. It should have been the line whenever Biden was asked about it. It should have been the line whenever anyone was asked about it by the New York Times or the Washington Post writing stories on it. You can't, after six months of absolutely unqualified promises, then turn around and say, well, I've just remembered that I'm his dad. That's just not how this works. So, uh, oh, and I should add, Uh, having done so in an election year, because the margins, that line that Joe Biden epitomized everything that was important about the rule of law was an election year ploy that was used as a contrast point with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. You can't then turn around after the election and say, well, I'm his dad. Of course, of course, a dad feels like that. I would feel like that, too. But that wouldn't change the fact that I was on the record over and over and over again not only saying what it was that I wasn't going to do, uh, but setting myself up as a result of it as an unimpeachable figure. It's another example of fraud. That's what we were witnessing there. We were almost defrauded about him and his mental health by the same media now trying to celebrate this, trying to find a way. Joe and Mika spent the first 40 minutes of their show talking about Cash Patel and P. Tag Seth. And, and when they finally got to the pardon, those two didn't even offer their opinion. 
They said nothing. Mika, who was out there saying he's the rule of law. He's the one who believes in, in the rule of law. It's And it's a stark contrast. So much respect for the rule of law that he won't pardon his son. Today, she had nothing to say about it. Okay, so they they almost defrauded us into electing a mentally enfeebled man. Then they tried to defraud us rich into believing Kamala Harris was a smart person who could handle yep. the mm-hmm. obligations of the presidency and that she joyful was inspirational. Too. She was joyful. Yep. She was she was brat. Um, she was all the things. And then, and then and then we get this, that he's not going to pardon his son. And the fact that he said it in June when Hunter was convicted, and then all the media allies ran out there saying, see, see, he respects institutions, norms, and the rule of law. Unlike that other guy, unlike evil Hitler. You see, that's why we have to stick with the Democrats in this presidential election, only to immediately turn around and say, F all that. Nothing's changed. I just am not going to do it. It's all part of a big fraud, which is why you've got some Democrats sounding like Joe Walsh today. Uh, We have his soundbite here, I think, somewhere. Let's see. My team will find it and play it. Yeah. Former Illinois Representative Joe Walsh. This pardon is just deflating. For those of us who have been out there for a few years now yelling about what a unique threat Donald Trump is, for for Joe Biden to do something like this, Trump, nobody's above the law, we've been screaming. Well, Joe Biden just made clear his son Hunter is above the law. Donald Trump lies every time he opens his mouth, we've been screaming. Joe Biden repeatedly lied about this. This is a father who saw his first wife killed, his daughter killed in a car crash, his two young sons survive. One goes on to have real difficulties with addiction. Another dies because of cancer. Um, This is a family that's really troubled. I mean, yes, he said he wasn't going to do this, but did anyone ever believe that that was the case? But this just (laughs) furthers the cynicism that people have about politics. and, uh, and, And that cynicism strengthens Trump because Trump can just say, I'm not a unique threat. Everybody does this. The anchor was Melissa Murray on MSNBC <laughs> last night. Yeah. So, I mean, he seems genuinely aghast yeah. at the at this yeah. result. Well, there, yeah, there's another category here of people who apparently believe this lie. Shocking. Like uh, our, our friend there and Tom Nichols, Johnson Shates, and some others who are consistent, who thought it was Biden being upstanding about the rule of law and now are, are appropriately outraged about it. So they're, they're being consistent. I think they're incredibly naive at, at the outset to believe this lie, but they did. I would just throw into your category. Well, the, the irony, of, Rich, sorry, the irony of him saying it yeah. on MSNBC, which has been peddling the oh, lie, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah, get, exactly. like I said, get your news source someplace else, sir. Go ahead. I just I just throw into the scams the whole Hunter Biden laptop, which we were made to believe was was a, a act of Russian disinformation, where you had these former national security officials lying, right? And this this letter, another case where Biden unashamedly had people lie on his behalf. They put that letter out there pretty much only so he'd have something to say in the debate in 2020 when this came up with Trump, and he just cited the letter, right? It's 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 been established as Russian disinformation as these uh, uh, several dozen national security officials say so. This just all plays into a really corrosive sense that things aren't on the up and up, and they're puppet masters behind all these uh, um, uh, facades we're we're seeing in in public. Whether it's the supposedly young and vigorous Joe Biden or the joyful and totally impressive. Kamala Harris, and it's it's why a lot of Republicans have time for appointments like Cash Patel, who mm-hmm. are uh, out there to kind of burn the place down. Now, I think the place needs major reform. I'm not Norms sure how well burning rich. it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how well uh, trying to burn it down is going to work out. But people have a lot of time for that, right? And and this this does play, as Joe Walsh was saying, does play in Trump's into Trump's hands in in that respect. And Big and the worst time. of it was the lawfare against Trump. I would say. We got to do uh, Cash Patel, and we'll talk about Pete, and we've got to talk about Kamala Harris's Thanksgiving message, but we have to take a break first. Before we go to break, I'll just do this one for you. Corrine Jean-Pierre, who repeatedly said he would not pardon Hunter. I mean, repeatedly. I'm not going to play his soundbite because it's long, but just trust me, it's more explicit even than Joe Biden was asked uh, on Air Force One about the pardon She said, the president took an action because of how politically infected these cases were. (laughs) 
A reporter pressed, the system doesn't get corrupted by politics for people whose name is not Joe Biden. You're twisting and misrepresenting what I'm saying. I'm talking about a particular issue right now. That's saying nothing. At one point, another journalist asked, does the president believe now and agree with Trump that the justice system has been weaponized for political purposes and that it needs root and branch reform? Corinne Jean-Pierre, no. Read the president's statement. Seriously, read the president's statement. He said he believes in the DOJ. He does. He says it in his statement. He says it in his statement, so it must be true. He also believes that war politics infected the process and it led to a miscarriage of justice. We don't know what war politics are, but we know she is lying. Yet again, we'll be right back. Is the education system the cause and solution to the biggest problems facing America? Check out a fantastic podcast from PragerU that is tackling difficult topics and conversations through the lens of education. It's called Real Talk with Marissa Street. As a mother, former educator, and the CEO of PragerU, Marissa believes that Education got America into the mess we're in, and education will get us out. That's why she built the pro-American nonprofit PragerU into a disruptor in education with videos that reach millions of young people every day. During her show, Marisha, Marissa interviews leaders in business, education, mental and physical health, and world affairs. Her guests have included Tulsi Gabbard, Douglas Murray, Michael Knowles, and many more. Together, they cut through the noise and get to the heart of complex issues, all from the perspective of an educator and a parent. Join PragerU's fastest growing podcast. Subscribe to Real Talk with Marissa Street on your favorite podcast platform or just watch at PragerU.com slash Real Talk. Okay, so we've been following the whole Pete Hegseth nomination to uh, defense secretary very closely here on the show. And there was news on that over the break and then uh, today as well. Pete's mom was very, very mad at him in 2018. And the New York Times got its hands on the email. (laughs) I got to tell you, like this whole thing is ridiculous to me. Now, the mom does not spare Pete at all in this email. She she gives it to him like nice and straight and she is doesn't mince words. But there are a lot of people who wouldn't want their moms chastising, winding up in the New York Times, especially men who find themselves in the midst of a divorce caused by their own infidelity. I think most moms would have a word with their sons about that when they've cheated on the wife, they have children. So in effect, you've cheated on the children too. And they're involved in a custody battle in which Pete was attacking the soon-to-be ex-wife, verbally, that is. And his mom didn't like it. Okay, so that's the one. And I'll just give you a flavor for what's in the report. It's very nasty. Um... And she is, it's very nasty of the New York Times, in my view, to report this. I just think publishing a mom's email, I I don't know how they got it. They say it was a source close to the Hegseth family. I guarantee you it was the ex-wife or somebody close to her. I mean, there's just no way it's not. But anyway, she writes as follows in 2018. "Um, I tried to keep quiet about your character and behavior, but after listening to the way you made Samantha feel today, I cannot stay silent. I feel I must speak out. You are an abuser of women. That's the ugly truth. And I have no respect for any man that belittles, lies, cheats, sleeps around, and uses women for his own power and ego. You are that man and have been for years. And as your mother, it pains me and embarrasses me to say that, but it is the sad truth. I'm not a saint, far from it, so don't throw that in my face, but your abuse over the years to women, dishonesty, sleeping around, betrayal, debasing, belittling, needs to be called out. Sam is a good mother and a good person under the circumstances that you created, And I know deep down you know that, but for you to try and label her as unstable for your own advantage is despicable and abusive. Is there there any sense of decency left in you? We still love you, but we're broken by your behavior and lack of character. Those are the highlights or lowlights. She's obviously mad because he was calling the ex-wife names in the context of their custody dispute, and the mother didn't like that and let him have it. She told the New York Times that she thought it was despicable they were printing this and that she sent him an email immediately after taking it back and saying she was wrong and she was sorry, that she was just angry. Um, But this is the way it goes. You know, you get personally destroyed if you throw your hat in the ring, you know, especially to be as part part of Trump's cabinet. For what it's worth, the reporter, Sharon Lafreniere, who wrote the New York Times piece on Hexeth that I just referenced, um, she also wrote the story about the alleged 2017 rape that uh, she says he was accused of. In her reporting, she missed, among other details, the following. The fact that his accuser 
was seen smiling with him on videotaped a a half hour before he allegedly raped her after having given her some drug that, you know, some some date rape drug. Did not report that she was back at her own hotel room by 4 Mm a.m., where her husband says she was not slurring or stumbling and was apologetic. She didn't think that was relevant, even though the woman claimed she'd been drugged and was seen on camera fine, not drunk, not stumbling at 1.30 a.m., smiling and locking arms with him. And then at 4 a.m. was back with her husband and the husband said she looked fine. Not That wasn't relevant to the New York Times, that her own husband said at 4 a.m. she was totally fine. Did not report that this woman refused the police request that she participate in what's called a pretext call to Hegseth after the fact, saying, you know, hey, Pete, why'd you do that to me? Trying to get him on camera, confessing to a crime. She declined to participate in that thing and did not report that while Pete was telling the cops that she said to him before she left the room, Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell my husband I fell asleep. They reported that piece of it, but did not then report that her husband simultaneously told cops that when his wife got home, she told him she had fallen asleep a story that matches up perfectly with the one Pete gave the police. That's the same reporter now reporting on the mom's email. I'm just saying the media has no interest in being fair or balanced in reporting these facts, and therefore skepticism is warranted. Um, And now they have a report, separate publication in The New Yorker, separate reporter Jane Mayer, today on his secret history. Okay, I'm open-minded. What is it? What did he do? Well, when he ran two different veterans organizations, Veterans for Freedom and Concerned Veterans for America, he was forced to step down, she reports, um, because of allegedly being repeatedly intoxicated while acting in his official capacity to the point of of needing to be carried out of the organization's events. Well, the one that I can find, she says plural, is he went to a bar, a strip club in February of 2015 with, I guess, Concerned Veterans for America employees. And according to this whistleblower, or according to a memo filled out by some employees um, and sent to the organization's senior management, he had to be restrained while drunk from joining the dancers on the stage of a Louisiana strip club where he had brought his team. So that's... (laughs) Okay. I'm like, I can't... All right. So that's one. Then there was another one where he went to an event in October of 14. And let's see. He had been out with three young female staffers, was so inebriated by 1 a.m. that a staffer who had driven him to his hotel in a van full of other drunken staffers asked for assistance to get him to his room. He was passed out and they did. Two male staffers got him into his hotel. So I think that's what they're talking about. Then they allege some financial impropriety, like spending that left the organization with less than $1,000 in the bank. Here is what I can tell you based on my discussions with someone close to the case. Uh, And that is that he was not at a strip club. So I expect that when Pete gets to respond to this, he's going to deny that he was at a strip club. And I would assume then deny that he tried to storm the stage while the strippers were dancing that um, this alleged whistleblower on whom most of these allegations depend is a bitter, in fact, I'm told like there are multiple and they have all been fired. They were fired by his organization, but the main is a very bitter person who's jealous of Pete and who was fired. Um, And that he did not yell, as they allege in this, kill all Muslims while drunk at a bar uh, openly where everyone could hear. He said that that never happened, did not happen. That um, Donald Trump is still standing by him And that while Pete admits to having gone drinking a lot, he did a lot of drinking when he came back from his three tours of duty, Gitmo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, um, he's gotten it under control. And while he's not proud of some of his drunken behavior, there is nothing in here that reflects on the character who he is today. So that's where we stand on Pete Hegseth today. Rich, your thoughts on whether... We should be putting stock into these reports and whether it's going to tank his nomination. So what we know clearly by his admission and by the the general sense of these reports, even if you don't credit every single detail, is that he drank a lot and was tomcatting around, clearly, right? And I don't think that should be disqualifying for 
a secretary of defense. The problem he has is it'd be one thing, you know, if we learn that Dwight Eisenhower, you know, as a young man had tried to storm the stage at a, at a strip club, if we're assuming mm-hmm. this is true about Pete and you're saying that, that uh, there's good reason not to, you know, he, he's responsible for D-Day, right? He is a, a world historical figure. And the, the, the problem Pete is going to have is the combination of of these reports and the fact that he's he's kind of a he, he's um, he's a risk, not not a security risk, but he he's a leap, you know, to to assume that he's going to be capable of the, running this complex complex organization. So that's why I think he he's in he's in some jeopardy. If he goes down, it's going to be a Matt Gates thing. I don't think there's going to be a floor vote against him. I think he'll. He'll, uh, you know, there'll be a subtle call made to him by the by um, President-elect Trump or someone around and saying, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten to be a little a little too much. But look, the, the whole thing is it's sorted. You, you wish, you know, you don't want to know this about the guy. You don't want to know this about a potential secretary of defense. But because of the messiness uh, of of the way he's lived his personal life and the divorces, it's it's all coming out or a version, maybe an unfair and stilted version of it's coming out. And that's it's just for him, for his nomination is problematic. Yeah, it's embarrassing to pee for sure. But it's it's just frustrating how you don't get the other side of like, be- mm-hmm. before we yeah. went and repeated the allegations against Doug Emhoff, trust me, my team and I did a lot mm-hmm. of behind the scenes research on who this person is. Is this a credible person? Yeah. Is there a history of accusations? Is there any red flag on her that we need to alert the audience to or that so great that we don't even think this story is reportable? Right. And we found all the opposite. And then we told the audience what we found. There, there's, we don't get to know. The New Yorker doesn't tell us anything. We don't Right. It's not even in there that these people yeah. were fired and disgruntled people. So like where where is yeah, w- that's I what I object to anything in the that Jane Yeah, I wouldn't credit anything that Jane Mayer writes. Yeah. I mean that's that's the problem. By the way, petty ante is also a thing. <laughs> just just picking up on our uh, there's both penny ante and petty ante. They mean the same thing. So Charles, I mean, part of what makes me uncomfortable is and I've I told my audience this last week, the audience is largely kind of on a different page than I am. I've been defensive of Pete. I definitely do not think he raped that woman at all, but he's certainly been a dog in his personal life, in his, uh, what did what did Rich just call him? What did you call him? Tom Cat. Tom, 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 Tom Cat. Tom Catting around, Tom Cat. yeah. Tom, Tom Cat, dog, what, what have you. Um, but my audience is less forgiving and they have been writing in saying, not for this position. You need somebody who can, who has self-control, who is dignified, who can't be compromised by like a Chinese spy. We've seen that happen Mm -hmm. with a Washington Post reporter. You know, like, you know, they don't want somebody who's too susceptible to the lures of the female persuasion. Anyway, what's your take on it? Well, I have many takes. I've been broadly defensive of Pete Hexeth because these allegations aside, I've thought most of the criticisms that were leveled at him were silly. Uh, stipulating that journalists covering this sort of thing are often disasters. Jane Mayer is a disaster. She's unhinged, in fact, and she should probably have been disqualified from ever writing about politics again after her behavior during the Kavanaugh scandal. But stipulating Mm -hmm. now, some of this is obviously true. That email is real. The mother confirmed that. and She said she regretted it, but she probably doesn't regret everything she wrote. Some of it is probably accurate. My question is always, to what extent does this intersect with the position for which they have been nominated? So I think that email, while obviously real and probably describing some behavior that was real, is not that informative because people do go through ugly divorces and families do get upset with each other. So even if a lot of that is correct, uh, I, I, I can't quite see where that would intersect. Jane Mayer's reporting, of which I'm always skeptical, is more so in that a question, not the question, but a question that the Senate ought to answer, and I'll take this opportunity to say once again, it is imperative that Donald Trump not be allowed to circumvent the Senate, which has a constitutional role, in my view, a mandatory constitutional role in advising and consenting and ultimately acquiescing to nominations. The Senate, which must do that, ought to look into whether or not he does have a pattern of drunkenness on the job, because that would matter. Uh, Somebody who at various points has got very drunk, including at office events, is not a risk. We've all done that. 
somebody who has a history of being unable to remain professional while at work or who has a problem with alcohol, which is the implication there, it might be absolutely scurrilous and untrue, I hope it is, uh, would be a problem. So I would like to see these allegations uh, investigated uh, by the Senate. They have a big staff over there that uh, are going to make an add to it as they see fit. Uh, they have the FBI as well, which by that point, I assume, um, uh, will be in transition mode. Uh, we should look into them. I mean, this is exactly why you want to vet your nominees. The way that you just put it, I think skepticism is warranted. And I think that uh, the, the the problems seem relatively minimal. I do, as an analytical matter, step aside from what I personally think, as an analytical matter, I think Rich is right. I do think that the risk here is that when you combine uh, that sort of baggage, even if we assume that only one quarter of it is true, with the fact that Hegseth is already a controversial pick, purely because he is uh, so young, inexperienced, um, is outside of the system, which is also, in my view, one of the advantages of the pick, uh, it may make it more difficult for him to get through. I have to say, Megan, that, that Charlie has demonstrated his suitability for any cabinet office because he proved on the election night po podcast that he can drink an inordinate amount of alcohol and still <laughs> maintain professional behavior. It was impressive. Unlike yours truly, who just last week I had one martini on the show and people were calling me a cheap date because I couldn't even get the ads out. Um I still think Pete will get it. I still have my money on him. I think the rank and file matters to Trump, what they think. And I don't think any of those guys are really going to be looking at Pete saying, oh, he got drunk a lot. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah no, that's true. You know, I mean, they he served a couple of combat tours, you know, he's in, yeah. in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was and, like very honorable. You go back, listen to that New York Times podcast on Pete Hegseth, and you will be cheering for him about how mm -hmm. he, when he knew there was danger, volunteered to be the first in the room. He, when there was somebody in his unit who did the wrong thing with uh, the opposing right. side, was the first to say, it isn't right. That person needs to be held to account. And it wasn't until he'd been in the services for a long time, actively fighting these battles, where he got a little jaded about who was leading the troops and like what the mission had been about and why he and his, his buddies had gone over there and why so many of his friends had died. And I think so many of our servicemen have had that same evolution and would forgive mm -hmm. Pete being publicly drunk and dealing with the adjustment back to civilian life and then back to Fox News and city life in New York. Mm -hmm. And then straightening his life out, finding, you know, leaning into Christianity, finding a third wife, yes, but whom by all accounts, you know, he now is happy with and who is happy with him. Um, I don't know. We'll see, but I think that's yeah, going to matter. He'll be Trump. the first first major cabinet uh, official with, with a tattoo since maybe George Schultz, Secretary of State. Really? Who supposedly had a, he was a Princeton guy and supposedly had a tiger tattoo in his rear end. This was, this was never confirmed. No, no way. I didn't know this was a potential deal breaker for cabinet nominees. My mom's no, I out. Think it'd be, no, I think it'd be a good thing, right, for the ranking yeah. file to have, have, a, have a two t tattooed guy as Secretary of State. You know what? You and make then, a good point about how they... The rank and file is not going to be uh, put put off by the these uh, no. the, the the fact that he was drinking too much. And, and even if he did rush the stage at a strip club, which I understand they're denying, yeah, exactly. but in any event, yeah. <laughs> um, my mom my mom worked her life at the Albany Veterans Hospital, so she t spent her life taking care of veterans. Maybe she could be considered if the sec if the if the Veterans Affairs Secretary thing falls through, she could be considered. But she does, I'll disclose right now, have a tattoo. She got it when she turned seventy. It's of a rosary and it's on her foot. <laughs> wow. It's going to air wow. the dirty laundry. Yes. How okay, many that, people get tattoos a, at age 70? That's, that's an uncontroversial not, tattoo. I don't think that would hurt her yeah. prospects in the Senate if she showed her rosary <laughs> I tattoo. I don't know. It seems kind of a Christian nationalist tattoo. Yeah, it, it might upset. That's if right. Diane Feinstein was still with us, maybe she would be very upset by your mom's <laughs> living the dogma loudly. Yeah. But otherwise, <laughs> I think it would help. Living the dogma. That's right. Okay. How about Cash Patel? Charles, because the left are not fans. He, I mean, you, it'd be, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody more loyal to Donald Trump than Cash Patel, who really had a major hand in seeing through the Russia, Russia, Russia lies and calling them out and calling out the personalities who push the lies. Um, and he does have relevant experience to become head of the FBI, but 
The left is pushing the claim by Bill Barr when Trump allegedly proposed him at the end of his first term saying, over my dead body, I think it was over my dead body, would I allow Cash Patel to take over the FBI? And he was the head of the DOJ at the time. So what do you make of Cash Patel as FBI director? All right, let me preface this. I am not a burn it down guy. I'm a conservative in a non burn it down sense, a literal conservative, a small c conservative, I suppose. I don't want to burn things down. I think we need a lot of reform in Washington, but by and large, Burning things down is a bad idea. You don't know why the fence is standing and so on and so forth. Second, preface point, I have criticized a lot of Donald Trump's nominees, some of whom I hope go down. Uh, Matt Gates, who won't be the nominee anymore. RFK Jr. ought to be voted down. I think probably Tulsi mm-hmm. Gabbard, although I don't know enough about it. And definitely the Department of Labor nominee yeah. who is a disaster on policy. Um, I don't have a problem with this nomination. You know why? Because I think we need to abolish the FBI. I've done three podcasts on this with Andy McCarthy, and I've slowly convinced him more each time. I've written a piece, (laughs) abolish the FBI, about this. I think from its founding, it has been a big problem. It doesn't fit properly into our constitutional system of government. And I think culturally, it is probably irredeemable. That is not to say every FBI agent is bad news, far from it. But it is just a disaster. And I can't think of an organization that needs a wrecking ball, if that's what Cash Patel turns out to be, more than that one. The encomia to the FBI that I've heard over the last two days, coupled with the pretense that it's some independent organization that exists in the ether, that is not responsible to the executive branch, a grotesque. Well, that professionalism, the lifelong bureaucrats in the FBI won't like this, good. I mean, you started off with J. Edgar Hoover, and the most recent disaster was James Comey. This is not an institution that is fit for purpose. This is to extend or perhaps torture my Chesterton's fence analogy with which I started. This is a fence that is covered in spikes and mold and is half fallen down, and nobody knows what to do with it, and all the kids are trying to avoid it because Mm. they're worried of getting sick. It's a disaster. I'm fine with Cash Patel. Put him in there. Let him do what he wants. This is the soundbite that must have reeled him in, uh, Rich. Sot 11, Cash Patel and the Sean Ryan Show in September. And the biggest problem the FBI has had has come out of its intel shops. I'd break that component out of it. I'd shut down the FBI Hoover building on day one and reopening the next day as a museum of the deep state. And I'd take the 7,000 employees that work in that building and send them across America to chase down criminals. Go be cops. You're cops. Go be cops. Go chase down murderers and rape and drug dealers and violent offenders. What do you need 7,000 people there for? Same thing with DOJ. What are all these people doing here? Looking for their next government promotion, looking for their next fancy government title, looking for their parachute out of government. So while you're bringing in the right people, you also have to shrink government. That's when Charlie's heart started to go a little flutter. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I do. So I'm not a big canceler of historic figures, but I don't get how that building is still named after J. Edgar Hoover, who in many ways is a symbol of FBI abuses rather than someone to be held up. I mean, if you just take the wiretapping of Martin Luther King alone, right. and then then the 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 suicide package they they sent to Martin Luther King, showing everything they knew about his tomcatting around in the hopes that he killed himself. It's just, it's unbelievable that that, that building still named Hoover. So my point would just be, and, and this goes to an, a number of these, these cabinet picks, the lion's share of whom I think are, are great and I, I wholly endorse, is that even if you're going to wreck the place, even if you want a wrecking ball, the, the wrecker, to, to adopt that term, has to really know what he's doing and really be an effective manager and be politically shrewd. And you're not gonna be able to wreck the FBI without getting congressional buy-in. And Donald Trump did run his campaign against these institutions, but not with any specific vision to what he was gonna do. If, if he just ref- made, reformed the FBI in a radical way, that would be like a top five accomplishment in his, his second term. But what is it? Obviously, Cash has some ideas there. But I, I tend to think, He'll get confirmed because I think anyone who doesn't is not uh, totally crazy the way I fear RFK might be, or doesn't have you know ethical problems the way Matt Gates uh, did and the way you know <laughs> some of the reporting portrays 
Pete Hes- Hegseth is, is going to get Hegseth. through. Hegseth. Um, Hegseth. Sorry, I always mess it up. Uh, I know, Hegseth. I hear that on the editors. Hegseth. That's why, that's why, yeah, that's why I tend to say Pete. Um, <laughs> so I tend, to, I, I tend to think he'll get through. It's just with, with him and, and, and even Pam Bondi, you know, has a lot of uh, law enforcement experience, right? Her resume is pretty good, but doesn't have a lot of federal ex- experience. They're going to be resisted at every turn. And do, do they really, do they know what they're doing enough to defeat those people? That that would be my concern. But do we have time I have for a, me to slightly disagree yeah. with Rich? Yeah, go for it. Well, I, I think that that is exactly correct with the vast majority of the bureaucracies in DC. I certainly think it's true of the Department of Justice. I think it's probably true of the Department of Education. And if we wanted to go through labor, energy, commerce, transportation, they have so many moving parts and there's a certain policy expertise that is necessary for a reformer. I'm just not sure that one needs more insight into the FBI than we heard Cash Patel give in that clip. To me, those are the three problems. One is the intelligence gathering part of it. I think I'm right in saying Andy McCarthy agrees with me on that. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Another is that it just does not spend enough time, as Patel puts it, being cops and enforcing federal law in a really obvious way. And the third is that by having all of those people in that building rather than spreading them out, you are creating this bureaucratic climate culture that leads to people wanting to get into politics and their propinquity to Washington DC and its institutions makes this a problem even more so. Um, So I think that's enough. You know, when I listen to the vast majority of the people who want to smash things up talk, I think you'll fail for exactly the reasons that Rich outlines. It it really does matter to have knowledge if you're a reformer. But with that one, he's running essentially a very large police station. And I think that sending him in there would probably be refreshing. Mm. I have a thought. Cash could do it for two years and see what he could get done. Or maybe he, you know, this is the kind of job that wears people out. Maybe he won't do the full 10, which you're supposed to get. But then I do see as a potential number two, like a backup option, um, if Cash wants out, or if Pam Bondi decides to, you know, leave, because these are very stressful jobs. I see your governor, Charlie, Ron DeSantis, after he finishes his term as governor, as a great person who could step into either one of those roles, Mm -hmm. who is totally on board with Trump's agenda, especially on the FBI. I've talked to him about it myself and would know how to get it done. Now, I like cash. I hope he gets through. I'm just saying that like, he's somebody who's in the wings because he's he's going to be term limited from running again and he could be of great help. What were you going to say, Rich? But that's a great, but that's a great example of someone who has exactly suited to some sort of task like that. Because he's yeah. been in Washington, right? He was a congressman, but he's been in Florida and run administrative agencies and brought bureaucracies to heal and use them to implement his vision and his agenda. So you could slip him in there and whatever it is you want to do, there's a strong chance he'd make it happen. The the worry I have with, with some of these people who are less experienced is they'll show up in the building and they'll never really even know enough to know what's going on. That's, mm, that's right. my fear. And experience is not, you know, experience can be a symptom of being overly complacent and too establishment and not creative and, or imaginative enough. Yes, but it can also be hugely important to getting the job done. And people accuse me of, of being, you know, a, a overly romantic Reaganite. But the greatest example of this at J- the Department of Justice was Ed Meese, who by the time he was working for Reagan in the California governor's office in the, in the mid 60s, had a, a, um, more experience in legal affairs than Matt Gates will ever have. You know, he was a prosecutor. I think he was teaching law. He was in private practice. And then he worked for Reagan. And, and what does he do? His whole task there is defeating uh, the left's lawfare against Reagan and his agenda. Took a different form there but it, then, but it still existed, and bringing the bureaucracies to heel. Then he's in the White House for the first term. What does he do? He's the White House counselor, and it's all about bringing the democracy to, to he, the bureaucracies to heel. Then he shows up as AG. And he transforms the place, transforms the place, historic attorney general. And he wouldn't have been able to do it without the the experience. And and someone like DeSantis, the experience would be a key thing, too. I got to ask you about this uh, soundbite, which is driving our friends on the left crazy today. This is Cash Patel uh, with Steve Bannon on The War Room, SOT 35. Cash, I, I know you're probably going to be head of the CIA. 
But do you believe that you can deliver the goods on this in a pretty short in a pretty short order of the first couple of months so we can get rolling on prosecutions? Yes, we got the bench for it, Bannon, and you know those guys. I'm not going to go out there and say their names right now so the radical left-wing media can terrorize them. But, excuse me, the one thing we learned in the Trump administration the first go-around is we got to put in all America patriots top to bottom. And we got them for law enforcement. We got them for intel collection. We got them for offensive operations. We got them for DOD, CIA, everywhere. We will go out and find the conspirators, not just in government, but in the media. Yes, we're going to come after the people in the media who lied about American citizens, who helped Joe Biden rig presidential elections. We're going to come after you, whether it's criminally or civilly. We'll figure that out. But, yeah, we're putting you all on notice. That they're going to come after people in the media who lied uh, to help Joe Biden rig the election in 2020, et cetera. I don't know what that means, Charlie. Uh, I'd love to ask him. We'll probably have him on and I'll get the chance at some point. But I don't know what that means exactly. But my, my overall thought when I heard it was, you just like you can't like there are some things you can do, but what yeah, what would be on. the specific cause of action? Like you even like tough talk on Bannon's war room is fine. It's one thing, but you actually ha- you cannot file a complaint that will survive one round of motion practice unless you have a colorable legal claim, criminal or civil, or it will be thrown out on the four corners of the document. So I I need to know more before I can say whether that's bullshit or what it is. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, he's trying to impress Steve Bannon, which is his first mistake. He also repeated the lie that the 2020 election was rigged or stolen, which it wasn't. Uh, the guy's a wrecking ball. I just want to wreck the FBI, so I'm happy to put him in there. But he <laughs> he's talking nonsense, and it's a good thing that he's talking nonsense. And in most circumstances, saying that sort of thing would be disqualifying in and of itself because he's effectively uh, promising that the Trump administration will undermine the First Amendment. Um, I mean, there's just there's no excusing that. that, that yeah. is, I mean, this is also a problem that that, that movement uh, on the right has, Megan, which is that there are a, a bunch of podcasts, um, that's one of them, uh, the incentive structure of which is essentially um, a killer uh, for anyone who succumbs to it, because they go on, they know what uh, they're supposed to say, they know who's listening, and they push it too far. Um, mm. And he did it there. I this is this it. is the most foreseeable pitfall, I think, for the for Trump coming in. If he tries to do something like this, one, it'll be an all-consuming controversy. Two, it'll be unpopular. And three, as you point out, it'll fail. Right? So this is this is a totally foreseeable blind alley that that he he desperately needs to. Avoid, but there are things he's he said that suggest he's interested in doing it, and things that are being said on shows like that that su- suggest he he should do it, and it's terrible advice. Yeah, I don't see. I mean, like if you can show me the cause of action against a media person, there there are certain things like defamation law you can use potentially. Okay, well, let, let's see it. But short of that, there is no cause of action. What you can do is defund places like NPR. And he should do that. That's not mm-hmm. the FBI's mm-hmm. job. Um, but we mm-hmm. should, like Doge, should be putting them at the top of the list. It's only $100 million yeah. a year, but it's $100 million we shouldn't be spending. You guys are the best. It's a pl- We did it sober. No, thank you. We, we <laughs> got some grammar lessons, and uh, I learned a lot, as always, guys. I, thank I, you. And, I, and I'm trying to learn how to say excess. Exactly. Yeah, we will get Kamala Harris's little nieces out there. And, they, you know, they're great at explaining pronunciations. Great to see you. Thank you. All right, coming up, uh, our friend Marsha Clark, famous prosecutor, is here, and we're going to ask her about this Joe Biden pardon, uh, as well as something happened in her neck of the woods. You know, she's obviously the OJ prosecutor in California, and there is a real question now about whether the Menendez brothers are about to get let out of jail. The prosecutor who was interested in it lost. So what's going to happen now? That's next. Want a great gift for yourself this holiday season? I mean, that's how it goes, right? One for them, one for you. (laughs) I want to tell you about the Genucel jawline treatment with dual peptide and MDL technology, Genucel's most advanced ever. The jawline treatment not only tightens the saggy jawline, but it plumps the layers of your skin to contour, define, and sculpt the jawline and neck area within minutes. And with the Genucel immediate effects product, you could see tightening in minutes, and the results get better every day. Just in time for Christmas, 
and the holiday season, save over 70% off GenuCell's complete skincare package featuring the jawline treatment and GenuCell's immediate effects product. You will even get GenuCell XV wrinkle treatment included. Go to GenuCell.com slash MK today and start looking years, even decades younger tomorrow. G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash MK. GenuCell.com slash MK. And as a special holiday gift, every package order includes a bonus beauty box with two, count them, two skincare bestsellers. All orders automatically upgraded to free priority shipping. GenuCell.com slash MK. There is an epidemic affecting two out of every three Americans, poor gut health. Processed foods, stress at work, fluoride in the water, and even toxins in the air you breathe can overwhelm your digestive system. You might expect to feel the bloating and heartburn, but the sleepless nights, afternoon crashes, even mood swings, these are all signs your gut may need some attention. While most probiotics get torn apart in your stomach acid, the spore-based strains in Just Thrive Probiotic are clinically proven to arrive in your gut 100% alive, creating a fortress of good bacteria that can support digestion, immune system, and mental clarity. Just Thrive Probiotic is a non-GMO and gluten-free product, and you can choose between berry-flavored gummies or easy-to-swallow capsules. You can even open the capsule and mix the contents into your morning coffee or sprinkle it over your food. For over a decade, Just Thrive has been fighting to make Americans healthy again with science-backed solutions you can trust. To join the gut health revolution, visit JustThriveHealth.com and save 20% site-wide with promo code MEGAN. That's JustThriveHealth.com, promo code MEGAN. Some incredible legal news out of California recently. The Menendez brothers, who were convicted of murdering both of their parents some 30 plus years ago, may be getting out of jail. And of course, one of Hunter Biden's guilty verdicts he was pardoned for took place in California as well. Who better to talk to about all of this than the one and only Marsha Clark? Marsha has a new book out as well. It's called Trial by Ambush, Murder, Injustice, and the Truth about the case of Barbara Graham. It was just released. This thing is amazing. It's a page turner. She goes deep into the sensational trial of Barbara Graham, who was the third woman executed at San Quentin in 1955. But she has found a lot of facts about this case that will give you serious pause about whether this was a proper trial, conviction, never mind execution. Marsha, great to see you again. How are you? Hi, Megan. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm awesome. All right, let's do some news of the day, and then we'll talk about the book, which I really am fascinated by. Great job on this. Menendez. So they there's a bunch of newfound sympathy for them based on this, you know, docudrama that was released about them. And Gascon, who was the outgoing DA, decided to throw a Hail Mary pass to Los Angeles voters not to vote him out by saying, I'm going to let them out, or I'm now in favor of resentencing, basically letting them out. They're supposed to be serving life in prison, but he lost. So now there's a new DA, Nathan, is it Hochman? Hochman? I think um, it's Hochman. Hochman? Well, whatever. He's coming in. Hochman's yeah, I know coming what you in. mean. Yeah. I don't know yeah. how Nathan feels about the Menendez brothers, but I know the judge has moved this resentencing hearing, which is basically should they get out of jail, to January 30th. So what do we think is likely to happen? It's a good guess. I mean, it's only a guess. I don't have any inside knowledge. I should just start by saying that. I was in the office when the first trial happened, but I had nothing to do with it. We all had our own cases. So I I can't say I know more than the average person. Um, my guess is it will... I can't make a guess. I don't know. You know oh, come how, on. What no, they come would on. Do. I, I won't know, hold it I against you. I, or, <laughs> yeah, as I don't I hate predicting. I don't think they're going to get out. I don't think this is going to happen. Um, wow. I don't think anybody was that impressed with Gascon's position. As you know, he lost. Um, Hockman actually kind of chided him for making this Hail Mary play in the midst of the election when he was like double digits down and very suspiciously comes up with this big you know, big parade about, oh, the the poor Menendez brothers. I wonder if people are thinking at all about the fact that there are others in prison um, serving a sentence of life without, which is what they're serving. Uh, that means life without the possibility of parole, who are much less culpable. I have clients that are serving life without the parole, without parole right now, who never killed anyone. So mm. it, it does make me think, 
Now, wait a minute. You know, I, I know that their defense was, and everybody should know this. I, I know you know, Megan, but just to uh, underline it for the audience, the defense is not, oh, daddy boinked me and mommy wouldn't stop him, so I get to kill him. It wasn't that. The defense was, you know, daddy threatened to kill me. I believe he was going to kill me, even if it, you think I'm unreasonable in thinking that. I genuinely believe it because of things he said and did toward the end. Um, that was their defense. It sold very well in the first trial, well enough to hang the jury pretty solidly. In the second trial, not so much because there was much less of the defense evidence of abuse. Make of it what you will. The second jury uh, and the second jury was already comprised of some people who were probably a little pissed off that the first jury didn't convict. So I think that tells you something about the climate even back then. And today, mm. you know, today now you have balancing forces. You have a, a greater awareness of abuse, child abuse, and the kind of trauma it inflicts. And we are, all, I think, are more sensitive to that. And that's a good thing. But you have to remember that doesn't that's not a license to kill. So, and when you think about, are they just getting this because they're celebrities? Because they were rich kids? Because you had, they, you know, Kim Kardashian was their, he was their champion you, to some extent. Um, yeah. I don't know that people love that. So I think all of that, unfortunately, is going to come into play, which it shouldn't. It should be a straight up call for the judge in terms of balancing all of the equities. But, you know, I guess we'll see what happens. It's so good to talk to you because I talk to your partner in crime. He's not really, you just come on together sometimes. Mark Garagos, but I know he's a friend and you guys have grew up in the California legal system together. And of course he's representing them and is 100% on the other side and came on and totally convinced me that they should be let out. Now I hear you talk. I'm like, ah, no, these are good points. Um, well, we'll wait and see what the judge does, but you heard it here. Marsha Clark, one of the best says, don't, don't bet on it. And then getting out. Mark Garagos said they'd be home with him for, for Thanksgiving dinner. Now that didn't happen. <laughs> It's not no, going to be Christmas oh, yeah, dinner. It, oh, I mean, boy. <laughs> and now we're shooting for like Valentine's Day or Easter. Okay, let's talk about this book because um, this is a great idea. First of all, how did you even think to write this book? Again, it's called Trial by Ambush, Murder, Injustice, and the Truth About the Case of Barbara Graham. I never heard of Barbara Graham. Um, so how did you even think to write about her? Uh, good question. So I was actually thinking about writing about someone else. And I had been thinking about writing a true crime book for a long time. I've been handling appellate cases for the defense, court appointed cases for 15 years, 16 years now. And I kind of thought, oh, I handle true crime every day. Really, I'm gonna write a book. But then it kind of, I warmed to the idea as I thought, well, it would be nice to take a deep dive and tell the story and look back at you know, what they did and how they did it and why they did it. And was the verdict correct? You know, it would be so interesting to look at it from a different point of view. And I was investigating a totally different case. And the, that case I was looking at initially turned out to be just another monster in the closet, kind of, a you know, another bizarro, freakish person, a woman. But, you know, I, that's not enough. If I'm going to go and do a true crime story, I want it to be about something. I want it to be about some principles and something that resonates in today's world. And I just happened to see a footnote that mentioned Barbara Graham. I thought, oh, let's look. She was executed as well. Let's look and see what happened to her. So when I first saw it, and I saw that it was kind of its own trial of the century back in 1953, there was a book written about it, actually a, another book, um, the one I recommend, Proof of Guilt by Kathleen Cairns, which does mention the Barbara Grant case, doesn't go into it a lot because it's a book about the death penalty, but it didn't go into the trial. And I thought, well, there's probably been a ton written about it. I'm not going to bother. You know, I don't want to go on that tread ground that's already been trodden to death. But then as I looked into it, I discovered, well, people hadn't really written about it. There was a lot of press coverage back in the day. I mean, a ton, a ton. Mm -hmm. But But the coverage was this breathless media kind of, um, tabloid coverage that spared no no word in the thesaurus for the way she looked, her hair, her makeup, her clothes, and it was ridiculous. And I thought, wait a minute, maybe there's something here. And then I start to read all of the articles that were there, and they're short. There's a one here and one there, and then there's a book. I thought, okay, that's it. That probably did it for me. I won't write about it. Turns out to be a book written by one of the tabloid reporters that was out after Barbara on the warpath from day one, and he collaborated with the prosecutor. I thought, okay, I don't know that this is going to be so unbiased. And as I read the book, I realized it's got a lot of stuff in there that can't be true. So well, I thought, you know, okay, when, when I'm looking at her, it. as you're talking and we're showing the pictures of Barbara, uh, and you, you point this out, obviously this is a main theme of the book, but you look at Barbara Graham and the first thing you notice is she's stunningly attractive. And yes. what I 
am thinking about is, I've told the audience this before, but when the Anna Nicole Smith case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, it was on, it was on bankruptcy. It was on um, uh, probate law, Marsha. It was on probate law yeah. and whether she should get you know, the, the money from her dead, very elderly husband. And no one gives a damn about probate law. I had been to the U.S. Supreme Court covering a lot of very, very boring cases and nobody flooded the, the courtroom. No media. Yeah. But Anna Nicole yeah. Smith showed up that day and she looked amazing. She lost all this weight. She had this great black outfit on. It was like she came in and, and everybody was like, Whoosh! and suddenly everybody wanted to know about probate law. And Barbara Graham <laughs> had a similar star factor, even though she wasn't a star, but she they'd never seen the likes of this kind of a person at a murder trial. Right. It's, it was, especially back in the fifties, the juxtaposition of this beautiful woman charged with this really heinous crime. And the crime is heinous because it was a, a home invasion robbery murder of this elderly woman, totally innocent, and was only even targeted because they believed that her son-in-law, who was a big casino entrepreneur, Tudor Scherer, um, would come and visit her from Las Vegas and leave money with her in a safe. So they targeted her thinking that they were going to find a bonanza in her house. But they also knew she was very security conscious. She was a vaudeville trooper who traveled the world and was not used to having a house. And she kept it locked down all the time. And they knew that there's no way she would open the door to a man. So they needed a lure. And that was Barbara. She was petite. She was beautiful. She knew how to say, I'm sorry, my car broke down. Can I use your phone, please? And of course, Mabel Monaghan, the, the innocent victim, let her in. And then the men followed Barbara into the house. And that was mm. that. And so this juxtaposition of the beauty and then the two beasts that were flanking her, which were the masterminds, the actual masterminds of this case, um, were thugs and mass murderers. And none of it fit together. None of it made any sense. And I realized that, you know, the only way to get the truth of this, because the press was not reliable, the book that I found was not reliable, I have to get the trial transcripts. That's the only way to know the truth about this. And that was its own journey, hunting down, you know, a case where it was always over 70 years old wound up getting lucky with people who were willing to help and advise me the death penalty cases, you should, I should know this, having handled them, transcripts for a death case are never destroyed. They, they are kept forever. And so we went to the archives and sure enough, it took months, but I got them, all 4,000 plus pages of them. Wow. So, yeah. But then you, you, you were horrified by a couple of things you found. And one that will be interesting to the audience is, you and she had similar experiences with the media and the way you were being portrayed and the way they were portraying her. Can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, no and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it's again, it, it's almost like a man bites dog situation. When you see a woman doing something you're not accustomed to seeing a woman do, whether it's violent murder or being a prosecutor in a high profile case, which seems ridiculous to me, which is why I'm laughing, because there were so many female prosecutors at that time that, that were handling high profile cases. And yet the world was not aware of that. They were not aware that this is a pretty common thing, even in the 90s, as of the it's 90s. It's not what you saw on the TV um, shows. Yes, exactly right. You saw Law & Order, you know, da -da, it's always a man, a white man. <laughs> yeah. This time it wasn't. And, and like, it was really- all those crime shows. Every crime show, you know, yes. the, growing up in the 70s and the 80s, it was always a male prosecutor. Absolutely right. Absolutely. So that was something unusual. But if anything, really, Megan, I've got to say, reading Barbara's coverage made me feel like, boy, and people thought I had it bad. Uh, not, that was nothing compared to what Barbara was put through. And it was it was wildly inaccurate as well. I mean, in my case, it was too. But I remember specifically seeing a picture of her um, when her ex-husband walked in the courtroom. And it was it was expected that he was going to back her alibi. Um and then it was expected that he would, he might not. So he, she, he came into the courtroom. It was a bombshell. And she was looking over her shoulder. They described it in the press, her malevolent glare, her eyes, two pools of gleaming, vicious hatred. And oh, wow. She was looking over her shoulder. That's all she was doing. There was absolutely right. nothing about her expression that said anything like that. She was set up to fail very clearly by a media that was selling a bunch of copy based on these descriptions of her. And, but the most, this isn't just Marsha Clark, who's sympathetic, empathetic to a, a female victim or, or not a victim, but in a way she was a victim. Uh, this is, you actually found real testimonials. Well, one in particular, a letter by the key, one of the key perpetrators that did not match up with his trial testimony at all. 
animal. And it wasn't turned over to the defense. It's exculpatory evidence, not turned over to the defense. Again, it's called Trial by Ambush, Murder, Injustice, and the Truth About the Case of Barbara Graham, out now on Amazon and other booksellers by Marsha Clark. And I want to tell the Sirius XM audience, the good thing about this book is it's not everywhere. It's not being pushed everywhere. So if you have a family member who's into true crime, knows Marsha maybe, is a fan, watch the OJ trial, whatever, this is a great gift because people won't see it coming. You know, they'll be like, oh, this is, and I'm telling you, this is a riveting story. Like who's ever heard of this woman? She meets a very dark ending, which is, you know, we've kind of shown you, Uh, but how she got there and Marsha's deconstruction of the case is a page turner. So check it out, Trial by Ambush by Marsha Clark. So Marsha, Tell us about this testimony that you found. So this was amazing. When the case was first being investigated, they wound up having to arrest Barbara and Jack Santos and Emmett Perkins before they really could make a case against them because no one was talking. And without some, they had no physical evidence. They had no eyewitness. They had no outside person. Someone on the inside had to break. Eventually, they wound up breaking John True, who was a member of this team that went in to the home invasion robbery and and committed this heinous crime. John True had no record. He was a deep sea diver, but he was no Terry. And they found him and they sweated him for, I think, uh, almost three days in jail and eventually even brought in some friends to try and beat him down and talk to them. You've got to give us a statement because they can't make a case without him. And they did. Uh, Ultimately, he said, I will not talk unless you give me full immunity for all charges, I walk out the door. And even got the DA himself to get on the phone to promise it. And the DA did. They then went up, they flew up to take his statement with a stenographer. This is an official statement, 42 pages long, where they question him about the crime. He gives a halting version of it where they have to pry it out of him, like with flyers, but they get it. He makes a statement. And that statement should have been turned over to the defense immediately. That is one of those things that just even back then, even in the 50s, you must turn over the statement of a key witness who is also an accomplice, of, for God's sake. You couldn't get more important than that. They never did. They hid it. They pretended it was just a hi, how, you, how are you, meet and greet kind of thing. And you know that they never turned it over because the defense talked about it in their closing argument. You know, I don't know what they said. I don't know why they said it, but, you know, we're not going to, uh, we don't have to worry about that because... There was nothing to it. And the and the prosecution went along with that and deliberately hid that statement. And it was key because that accomplice's credibility was everything to the case, everything. If you can't make the jury believe him, you have absolutely nothing. So it was a real uh, horrible thing, even though there were some respect, in some respects it was consistent, but in many it was inconsistent. It was enough, I think, for a jury to say, I'm not sure I believe this guy. They hid mm-hmm. that. But that's not all they did. I mean, there were all kinds of shenanigans, some of which were legal back then, but they were pushing the envelope. And and I think that was part of my my, my issue with this, which was a shocker to me. I went into this thinking very excited because the lead prosecutor was an icon in the DA's office, somebody I revered, we all did, we all did. It was a joke in the DA's office. Oh, if we lost a case, oh, Jay Miller Levy could have won it. Oh, you know, he would have won it. He was an amazing, he he tried Carol Chessman, uh, the red light bandit, rapist, uh, all these famous cases. And so he was the lead prosecutor in this case. And I was expecting, anticipating the excitement of watching our the icon in action. And what I found was a cheap shot artist. What I found was somebody who pushed the envelope in ways that was even a federal judge said was unseemly and horrifyingly um, personal in his attack, misogynistic. Yeah, I guess you could call it that too, but it was much worse than just that. He went after her in a personal way that unfairly maligned her. And I, prosecutors, you know, have a duty that goes above and beyond the client. I, a defense attorney owes only his client. A prosecutor owes a fair trial and owes, a, owes it to the jury to present a case in a fair way, in an even-handed way. That is the, the gig. And so you have to be careful of stepping over the line. It's one thing that you can say, well, I can, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. And you have to always think about what's right and what's fair. And I don't think they were thinking about that at all in this case. She was double-crossed by a couple of people during the course of the trial, including a jailhouse informant. 
Um, this guy, John True, was you know treated like his word was inviolate without knowing that he had said a very different story that would have been much more helpful to her had her defense lawyer known of it. And in the end, she was convicted of murdering this poor woman. Um, meanwhile, you don't deny that she took place, she took part in the crime, that she was the person to get her to open the door, but that she, there was absolutely no reason to believe that she could have beat, beaten her to death. I mean, basically that's what happened. I and mean, she was this petite, tiny little woman. And you point out that she was accused of pistol whipping her, but even the main witness said she had left the gun in the car. So it does seem like they were frothing at the mouth to get this beautiful woman. It was just too good a story, no matter how not credible the main witness was. So then it, it takes an even darker turn she gets sentenced to death. I mean, it's like yeah. one thing to get the verdict wrong. It's bad enough to be, you know, to get that wrong. But then she gets sentenced to death and they they put her in the gas chamber. So much yeah. so, like so horrifying that they made a movie out of this. You point this out yeah. called I Want to Live. And uh, this is from 1958. It featured actress, actress Susan Hayward playing Barbara. And here, viewer warning, it's disturbing. It's the execution scene. Uh, but here's a bit of that. Barbara, I'm very sorry. Goodbye and God bless you. I want a mask. A mask? I don't want to look at people. I don't want to see them staring at me. I have one. When you hear the pellets drop, count ten. Take a deep breath. It's easier that way. How do you know? It's crazy. It's pretty bold to have a film like that in 1958. You know what's interesting about it, Megan? People who saw the film back then and even now um, are aware that it was a thing. The, the film was largely fiction. They really whitewashed Barbara to an extent that was a little absurd. She was not an angel, but she certainly wasn't a demon. She was a misdemeanor kind of check hider, you know, dice girl. She was never violent in her life. But the one thing about that film that was acknowledged by all sides, including police, to be absolutely accurate was that execution scene. They did it down to the letter. And in the book, I actually um, liberally quote from the testimony of the nurse who spent the night with her before she was executed and talked about everything that happened up to the execution. And the reason that we got into that is even after her death, the prosecutors still were going after her to try and claim that she had done a last minute confession, which wasn't true. So there was no end. They, I mean, they chased her into the gas chamber and then continued to go after her. It was pretty horrifying. It was like the they had to have a notch in the belt. It went beyond seeking justice. That's that's something else. So she didn't, there was no last minute confession, but there was a very interesting statement to one of the priests who was with her. And for that, you will have to read Marsha's book and you will be glad you did. It's called Trial by Ambush. Murder, Injustice, and the Truth about the case of Barbara Graham. Marsha, great to see you. I guess before you go, parting words, do you support the sweeping pardon of Hunter Biden? What? The, uh, he said he wasn't going to do that. Didn't he say <laughs> right. he wasn't going to pardon him? What he did. Well, I have nothing. I have nothing. Yeah. I don't, you know, yeah. I mean, is it, do we need this? Really? Do we need this? I mean, now there's been so much criticism of Trump's pardons for so many for others. You know, how can we say that either side is blameless now? How, who do we look at? I, I, I don't get it. And after you said you wouldn't, I, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it needs to happen. No. You, you need to run for governor and set things right in California. And then maybe after that, you can take on the national problem many years from now. We'd love to see it. <laughs> you know how short my campaign would be, Megan? <laughs> Five <laughs> seconds. 
Five seconds. <laughs> well, I'd Marcia, vote for how you. Do you feel about it? Yeah, I hate it. That's it. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank you for being here. Great to see you too. <laughs> Thanks okay. for having me. Don't forget, check it out. Trial by Ambush by Marsha Clark. Thanks to all of you for listening. Coming up tomorrow, the guys from the fifth column return. That's always fun. Don't miss it. 